Turn to somebody nearby to you and say, I think it's about this, or seems kind of don't remember, or try to try to say in language what the fundamental thing of calculus is about. Okay, okay. Now that now that you've all given it a shot. What is it? What, what's the first fundamental theorem of calculus about? Somebody want to say it? Hunter? If little odds is a continuous function on a closed interval from A to B and big F is an antiderivative of little f, then the integral from A to B of little f of x dx equals big F B minus big F. Oh, okay. So that's actually the second fundamental theorem of calculus. That's the um, um, that's although we introduced it first, so it's understandable that you might think that that would be the first one. But um, uh, does anybody remember the other fundamental theorem of calculus? Mr. Al in the back. Yeah, I think it's a it's a limit. The limit of which is zero of f of x plus eight minus f of eight over eight. So in that sense, is a derivative of an area from x to x plus h. Under the curve. Right, right, right. So this was, um, so you're, you're talking about the, how, you, how you prove it, basically. Yeah. So, um, oh, yeah. right, so remember the idea, right, you start off with some function f, right, f is a continuous function on some closed interval, right, and then you make this, you make this other function, um, remember one, fundamental theorem of one, fundamental theorem of calculus one is about creating antiderivatives creating an antiderivative. Okay. Um, so you start off with some function and you, you want to create an antiderivative of it. And the way you, the way that what we see is that there's one way to do it. There, there is a way to do it. Um, you say let's create let's make this new function uh, big F and we define it as the integral from a to x of little f. Right? So you, you integrate this guy from a to x. So if this is a b, and this is your this is your function little f, right? This is the graph of little f. Then um, the way you the way you create your new function is saying we're going to integrate from a to x little f. Right? We integrate little f from a to x, and we call that value, right? We call that value big f of x. Okay, right? And then we said uh, we um, so. Uh, so here's the statement, if f is continuous and we, let, and we let big F be this guy, then in fact this big F uh, is an antiderivative of little f. <coughs> then this big F is an antiderivative of little f. Okay, so that's that's the that's the whole theorem there. I mean, I guess when we stated it the first time, we said then big F is differentiable, differentiable on A B, and in fact, its derivative is little f. Okay, so maybe that's that's you know, the full thing, but the idea that this is this is the gist of it, right? You can create an an antiderivative of of any continuous function. Okay. Any continuous function, you can make an antiderivative for it. Okay. So, um, okay. Is that is that at all right? Everybody all right? Okay. So, so for example, if I say um, I'm going to let uh, I'm going to create a function 
by integrating e to the t squared uh, over the interval uh, 0 to x. Okay, and I differentiate that with respect to x. Okay. Okay, then take five seconds and write down what this is equal to. Turn to somebody nearby and say the answer is, I think the answer is this. Okay, um, you two are nodding. Uh, one of you want to say it? Um, we just said that it was e to the x squared. e to the x squared, yeah, great. That's exactly right. Okay. e to the x squared. Okay, so this is exactly what the fundamental theorem of calculus is telling you. It says, if you create this area function guy, right, if you create this area function guy by integrating some function little f, so this is your little f, right? right? This is your little f, and we're integrating it, right? Um, you know, to spell it out, let, let, let little f be, let little f be um, e to the x squared. Okay. And this, what we're saying here is that we're integrating little f from 0 to x, right? And then, so we're creating a function, you know, the integral of little f from 0 to x. And then we differentiate that function with respect to x, we're going to get back little f. Okay? Is that clear? Okay, so this is exactly what the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus 1 tells you, that if you create these sort of, if you create these, um, Area area functions. Then, when you differentiate them, you get the integrand. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So you know, if I you know, if you made up anything, you can make up some crazy function. Right? You could say, well, I'm going to integrate e to the t squared. You know, cos you know sine sine t times t squared, or something like that, right? And you integrate between um, some fixed point, uh, 5 and x, right? And you differentiate it. Well, what's the answer? What's the answer? That, that equation. So what should I write here? Just to, just, to, just to make sure you get it right. What do I write here? Uh, e to the t squared. Oh, x squared. E to the x squared, right. E to the x squared sine x, x squared. Okay. Because you, this is a function, a function of x, right? T is just the dummy variable for the integral, right? So this t could be any, you know, this t we could replace with, you know, z or whatever, right? But that's not gonna, that's not gonna change this thing, right? You don't write, you don't write the dummy variable here. Okay. Yeah, this is what I was worried about. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes, Mr. Allen. Uh, do we assume? In faith, that there is an antiderivative for any continuous function. This is what we're this is what we're what we're seeing that that in fact any continuous function has an antiderivative. We don't have to prove that. We have proven it. Okay. We have proven it. This is what we did. We okay. we did it. We said, look, if we create this thing, then that thing is an antiderivative. Okay. That's kind of that's great because, um, you know. Um, a lot of functions don't have clean antiderivatives, right? If I say, tell me the antiderivative of e to the x squared, can you tell me a function that when you differentiate it, without using the fundamental theorem of calculus one, can you give me a function when you differentiate it, you get e to the x squared? The answer is no. <laughs> right? It's not, it's, it's in fact, there is no, clo there is no simple form uh, function whose derivative is, is e to the x squared. Okay, but that's not to say that this guy doesn't have antiderivatives. It does. It's a continuous function. You can, we can make this sort of area guy, and then the area guy will be its antiderivative. Okay, yes? Oh, but then did you take the antiderivative of that uh, of, of e t squared sine t whatever? So I'm not taking an antiderivative here. I'm taking actually an integral, a definite integral, right? And I, so what we're, what we're doing is saying that 
this function that we create, so we create this new function, and this function turns out to be the antiderivative. Okay, but we're not we're not um, we're not doing this. We're not doing we're not talking about the antiderivative. We're not talking about the like indefinite integral. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's 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 um, okay. So if I say something like um, let me see. So let me say it like this. Um, so let me, okay, so this is not what I'm saying. This is not what the fundamental theorem of calculus says. So if I say something like this, antiderivative of this is this. <coughs> right. Right. Anti, the anti the antiderivative of x squared is these guys, and I differentiate these guys and I get back x squared. Okay. That's not at all what I'm saying here. Okay, what I'm saying here is that I can create a um, if I make this if I make this area function guy, then that guy is an antiderivative. Okay, that's that's different from saying if the derivative of an antiderivative is the original function. Okay, so that's so that's definitely true. Right? If you take a function and you take an antiderivative and then you differentiate that antiderivative, you get back to your original function. That's definitely true, but that's not what the final theorem the 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 calculus is saying. That's that's far too simple. That's 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 the fundamental theorem of calculus is saying something much better than that. Okay, it's saying that if you take any continuous function, then this thing is an antiderivative of it. Okay. Okay, it's 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 very different. Um, um, okay. Let me do. Let's do a couple more examples uh, of using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, okay, so slightly more sophisticated example. So just now we said if you take the derivative of this guy, you get d to the x squared, right? So that's the first example we had. Um, here's another example, slightly more complicated. Suppose I take the example of uh, the derivative of this. The derivative, suppose I make, I make a function and this guy is the, the integral from 0 to x squared of, of your, your little f, right? So the, the integral from 0 to x squared of your little f, right? And I want to differentiate that with respect to x. Think about it for a minute and see if you can come up with the answer. This you have to use um, another bit of your previous knowledge. Okay, talk with somebody nearby and see what they're thinking. You need to invoke one other fact from Kak 1. You need to one, one, other, one other rule from Kak 1. Oh. So for now we this, right? <laughs> <laughs> so right now, physically, we're placing s squared here, which is another function I just built a few of us. It's not this x, so it doesn't look like it. Okay. Um, what, other, what other rule do we need to invoke? What's the other thing we need to use? Chain the chain rule, right? The chain rule. Right. So this thing here, um, do you do you want to tell me what the answer is? Um, do you want to try? Go ahead. I'll try. Yeah, go ahead. Try. It's okay. it, right? That's all right. That's all right. Um, so I just did e to the x squared. So e to the x squared. And then squared. Squared? Uh, or not 
Uh, the x squared would be squared, so... The x squared squared? Yeah, but then you multiply by that by 2x, or...? By 2x? You're close, you're close. Or, okay. Okay, you're, you're not far off. Okay, not far off. Okay, so, um, uh, so let's, let's, let's think about it, right? Um, this guy is, is big F of x, right? Let's call this guy big F of x. Okay, so now... This is, now we're differentiating, right? And we, we, what we saw was that the derivative of big F was just e to the x squared, right? Okay, now what we're doing is we're differentiating, what function are we differentiating now? F of big F of x squared, right? We're differentiating big F of x squared. Right? So what do we get by the chain rule? It should be <laughs> f time f time x squared times 2x. Oh, wait a second. You were right. <laughs> I'm sorry. You were right. Wow, that's crazy. Sorry. No, so yeah. I'm sorry. What's your name, please? Tanima. Tanima. Tanima is absolutely right. Okay. Great. Perfect. Why? What was I thinking? I don't know. Okay. So you say, okay, you take f prime, that's this thing, you evaluate it at x squared, so you get e to the x squared squared, and then you multiply by 2x. Okay, that's great. I, I should just give up. <laughs> okay, everybody, everybody see that? Everybody, everybody okay with that? Okay, so for example, uh, if I change it a little bit, change it again, I said, we're going to, Take the derivative of this guy, e to the t squared dt, from, from zero, to, 0 to sine x, right? Then take five seconds and write down the answer using the chain rule. So what's what's the answer going to be? Anybody? Yes, um, Elizabeth. Cosine x times e to the sine x squared. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So you take f prime evaluated at sine x. Right. So f prime evaluated at sine x times uh, uh, the derivative of the sine. Right. So if I, you know, if this were, if this were. Um, if I replace this with a u of x, right, it's going to be f prime, let me just call this thing u of x, whatever this, whatever function I put here, it's going to be e to the u squared x, e to the u squared x times u prime x, right, by the chain rule. Okay, is everybody all right with that? Any, anybody confused? No? Good? Okay, great. Okay. So this is how you this is how you use the fundamental. This is sort of an application of the fundamental first fundamental theorem of calculus, right? It says that if you have this sort of um, area function, and then you're or even some variation of the area function, and you differentiate it, then you can you can do it. Okay. Let me just make one dumb comment. Um, if I switch the direction like this, I said we're integrating from x to zero rather than zero to x. Um, well, what would the answer be in that case? They just put negative, right? Right, because when you reverse the order of the integral, you you reverse you get negative the integral. Okay, so just you know, some of the problems in the book involve you know, something is on the bottom rather than on the top. So nothing nothing impressive. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So. Um, Okay, so okay, let's 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 go on. So we said that fundamental theorem of calculus one gives you fundamental theorem of calculus two. Okay. So um, fundamental theorem of calculus two, as as uh, Hunter said earlier, is you know, uh, if f is continuous on a b and big F is an antiderivative of little f, uh, 
then the definite integral from A to B of little f is the difference of big F at the derivatives, uh, at the endpoints. Right. Okay. Let me let me call this just so we don't get confused. Let me call this thing G. So you have little f, you have, you have big G, which is an antiderivative, and you say that, look, um, uh, you can get the definite integral by taking the difference at the endpoints. Okay. Okay. So now let's try to figure out why is this true? Why is this true? Why is this true? Okay. And what we're going to need, so we're going to re need to recall a fact that if two functions have the same derivative, oops, same derivative, then something happens. If two functions have the same derivative everywhere, right, everywhere, if the same derivative everywhere, right, you've got these two cars and they, they're traveling at exactly the same speeds, um, they're on a track, they're traveling exactly the same speeds, right? When one car is going this fast, the other car is going the same speed. When the other one car is reversing, you know, so what do you, what do you know about these two cars? They just vary by a constant. They, their positions differ by a constant, right? Then the functions, uh, then they differ by a constant. <coughs> so we're gonna need, we're gonna need that fact. Okay. <coughs> okay. Okay. So let's let's try and explain why the second memo, second fundamental theorem of calculus is true. Okay. So um, uh, let big F be the area guy from before. So let big F be the function we just made in fundamental theorem of calculus. <coughs> okay. Um, uh, then big F of B minus big F of A equals what? Well, what's big F of B? <coughs> what's big F of B? Big F, big F is in, says integrate from, from A to X. Big F and B is going to be the integral from A to B. Right? We get the integral from A to B of little f. We subtract off uh, big F of A. What's big F of A? Zero, right? The integral from A to A, in other words, zero, right? Everybody's okay with that, I, I would think. Um, so what you see is that um, uh, the theorem is true for the area guy we just made, right? Right. Um, so if we create, if we look at this one antiderivative, and we take big F of B minus big F of A, we do get the definite integral. Okay. I think it's not getting through. Let me say it again. I don't. I. I. Uh, I'll say it many times. I have no sense if what if you understand or don't understand. Um, I can't read people's expressions. Um, uh, maybe because I don't have expressions myself. Um, I can't read people's facial expressions that well. Um, but uh, it looks to me that you actually don't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> so I'm going to say it again. Um, okay. Fundamental theorem of calculus says that. If you have an antiderivative, you take its difference at the endpoints, you get the definite integral, right? Okay, now we look at this one antiderivative from before. We, we take its difference at the endpoints, and lo and behold, we get the definite integral. Fundamental theorem of calculus seems to work for this guy. Okay, but what fundamental theorem of calculus should work for any antiderivative, not just this one antiderivative. Okay. 
So now, um, now let G be any antiderivative, not just that kind. Any antiderivative of, of little f. Okay. Okay. Um, what can we say about g prime and f prime? What's g prime? G is an antiderivative of little f, so g prime is little f. F was an antiderivative of big F was an antiderivative, so <coughs> that's the same, right? So these guys have the same derivative, right? G, big G, and big F have a little same derivative, right? Since g prime equals f prime, we know that g and f differ by constant, right? G must be f plus some constant, right? Some fixed constant. OK. Who can see the end? Who can see the end from here? G of B minus G of A. Are you dead? Is it like B minus A? Is? Um, same as F, B minus F. A. Exactly, right? It's going to be F of B plus C minus f of a plus c, right? The c's cancel off, and you get f of b minus f of a. But we already saw that that's the definite integral. OK. So it, does, it works not only for the f that we made, but in fact for any antiderivative. That's what we're hoping to see, that if you take any antiderivative and you evaluate it at the endpoints and take the difference, we should get the definite integral. And that's what happens. Okay. The way we saw it was we say, well, look, it works for this one guy we made, and anybody else is going to differ from that guy by a constant. And then when you take the difference, the constants vanish, and you get the definite integral again. Okay. Everybody all right? Are good all right? Hey, talk to each other for a couple seconds to make sure that you understand. And if you, if you can come up with a question, <coughs> that's, that's good. Come up with a question. Anybody? Come up with a question. Everybody else. Everybody. Okay. okay. Yes. Um, in the the first example part that you did, mm -hmm. um, why is there a minus zero at the end? Well, uh, this is um, this is f of b, right? And this is this is f of a, right? f of a was so big f of but big F is you integrate from A to X, right? Big F of X, integrate from A to X. We look at F of B, what's F of B? What's the integral from A to B of little f? What's F of A? Well, that's going to be the integral from A to A of little f, right? But the integral from, of F from A to A is the area, right, of this line, right? The area, the area under this point, which is 0. OK, so this is just 0. Other questions? Okay. Okay. 
Are there any, other, any, any other questions? Okay. Um, okay, so now you understand the fundamental theme of calculus, both parts of it, which is great. Um, uh, those of you who took top one with me um, uh, probably heard me tell this joke that you know I once uh, had lunch with my um, postdoc advisor, and he said, if you could plagiarize one theorem in history, what theorem would you plagiarize? That is, what name would you put on? He said, I, I actually proved this theorem, um, even though you, you didn't. Um, and I said, um, I said, uh, I thought about it for a bit. And I said, the calderon zygmunt decomposition. Um, and this is because um, the field of mathematics that both he and I, um, I mean, yes, he, he's, anyway, we, we do a, a, a kind of mathematics called calderon zygmunt harmonic anal analysis. And the, a lot of the results in that field can be, sh can be proven using this thing called the calderon zygmunt decomposition. So I thought, okay, this is a pretty good, you know, this is a, uh, I'd, I'd like to plagiarize that. But he said, you are thinking too small. Um, I would go for the fundamental theorem of calculus. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, he was, he, he's right. <laughs> yeah, if you wanted to put your name on one, one result throughout history, this would, this would be it. Okay, so, um, yeah. Yes, Professor Tunchitsky, you're right. <laughs> um, okay, so um, okay, so yeah, so now you understand uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is good. Um, okay, uh, a couple of things I want to say. Um, so there's uh, there's one thing that we can get from the fundamental theorem. A couple things we can no one more thing we can get from the fundamental theorem of calculus one. So fundamental theorem of calculus one gave us um, fundamental theorem of calculus two, but it also gives us something called the mean value theorem for integrals. Mean value theorem for integrals. Okay. So let's recall the plain old mean value theorem, right? Your old your old friend, the mean value theorem. It says um, pictorially, right, that if you have a function on, uh, you have f that's continuous on the closed interval a, b, and it's differentiable on the open interval a, b, then there exists, uh, I don't know if I've used this before, there exists a point c between a and b, where uh, f times c equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Okay. okay. Is there any symbol? Are you guys okay with this symbol? is an element of, there's, there exists a C in the open interval A, B, right? An element of, right, C, there exists a C that's an element of A, B, uh, where this happens. Okay. Okay. Now, um, uh, let's apply that to our big F from the fundamental theorem of calculus one. Okay, and see what pops out of it. We'll get a kind of kind of nice result. Okay, so this big F, right? Um, big F is continuous and it's differentiable on the interior. So we know that, so write down something. We know, apply the, apply the mean value theorem to, to big F. Take, take one minute and see if you can see what, what it says about big F.
turn to somebody nearby, tell them what you think it says. Or just say, I don't know. That's okay. <laughs> That's all right. Let's see. I Okay, so let's just let's just plug it in word for word for word, right? F is continuous on A B, differential on A B, so there exists a point in A B where oops, where what? F prime C equals big F of B minus big F of A over B minus A. Right? Certainly. You know, just just plug in you know, big F into the mean mean body there. Okay, but let's now let's translate. What's it say? What's big F prime? Little f, right? So there exists a point where I'm gonna erase this guy. Little f <coughs> equals big F of B minus big F of A. What's big F of A? Zero. 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 I'm gonna erase that. What's big F of B? The integral from A to B of a little f. Okay. Okay. So in other words, there exists a point where little f attains. What's this thing here? This thing we saw before. Something we saw something like this last class. Take the integral from A to B. Divide by b minus a. What's b minus a? The width of this interval, right? Right. Mm -hmm. You divide by the width of the interval. You take this area. You divide by the take this area. Divide by the width of the interval, and what do you get? Average. The average value, right? Okay. So this is the this is the theorem. Right, um, that if your function, so the theorem says, so this is the mean value theorem for integrals, mean value theorem for integrals. Um, if f is continuous on a, b, then there exists a point where f uh, C is the average value. The average value of F on the interval of B. sense and so maybe this makes a little bit more sense why we call it the mean value theorem right given any continuous function there's a point where you attain the mean value right there's a point where you attain the, the average value over that interval okay and you see how we get it right this is the proof right here right apply the mean value apply the mean value theorem apply the mean value theorem to this guy we got from the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus one. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, so we're using this, this idea again <coughs> that if you take the integral for, over some interval, we take the integral of some function over some interval, you divide by, divide by the width of the interval, you get the average value of the function over that interval. Okay, we used it last time, we, we're, we're stating, stating, it, stating it again this time. Okay, um, 
just for fun, uh, you don't have to know this part, okay, but um, let me give you another way of thinking about, so why is, why is this thing the average value <coughs> of f over a b? Why is this thing the average value of f over a b? Okay, so like I said, this is just for your uh, enrichment. Okay, you don't have to know this, but but maybe it'll help you understand things. Okay, okay. So, how many values are there of f between a and b? Right. Well, there's infinitely many values. Right. So, how do what do we mean by an average value of of f? Right. Do you take like all the values and then divide by infinity? Or you know, that's not going to work. Right. That's not going to work. So here's one way of thinking about an average value. You'd say, well, I'm going to I'm going to take um, I'm going to divide this thing into two parts, and I'm going to take one value, and I take another value, and then divide by two. Okay, right? I take one, I sample at one point, I sample at another point, I divide by two. That's an average value, right? Everybody, everybody think that's, that's reasonable? You take two, the, the value of two points, you divide by two, that's an average value, right? Okay, so now, um, and you say, okay, well, you know, that's, that's sort of a very coarse average value. So what I'm going to do is divide this thing into n parts. Okay, so divide into n subintervals. Divide into n subintervals and take, take n uh, samples. Right? And so you, you get these n samples call them like x1, x1 star, plus f x2 star, plus, plus f xn star, and then divide by n. Okay, and that would be, that would be some average value, right? This is some sort of um, uh, an average value of, of f, right? This would be one way of getting, you know, if, if somebody said, well, what's, what's the average value of a function? This would be one way to do it, right? You divide the base, and you take, you know, n different values, add them together, divide by n, that's, that'll give you an average value, right? Does that, that seem reasonable? Okay. Um, <coughs> okay. Uh, Okay, but then notice. No, 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 no. Okay. And then maybe what you would do is uh, uh, let n go to infinity. Right? Let n get bigger and bigger. And as n goes to infinity, well, that should give you something that's even closer to the actual average value. Okay? Right? That should be. Um, you get something that you believe is um, the average value of f on the interval, right? Because you'll take you'll take more and more points. You'll you'll take a billion samples, divide by a billion, add them together, divide by a billion. You take a trillion samples, add them together, divide by a trillion, right? This should be something like the average value, right? Okay, but then you notice. Um, this thing here, this thing over n, I'm going to write it in a funny way. Okay. I'm going to multiply it by b minus a, and I'm going to divide it. I'm going to divide it by b minus a. Okay. So this thing is the same thing as this thing, right? I just multiplied it by 1. Okay. You'll see we'll do this a lot. We'll multiply by things by 1. Okay. Now, what do you see this? What is this thing now? This thing is summation fxi b minus a over n. Uh, Right, as i goes from one to n. Right, but I'm not. I'm just rewriting it 
right? I'm pulling the, I'm putting this thing in, I'm putting the b minus a in on each term. Okay, is that all right? Okay, um, should I write it differently? I'm gonna write it differently. Right. You get fx one, fx fx one, b minus a over n plus fx n star b minus a over n. Right. Okay. Everybody okay? Okay. Well, what is this? What is this thing here? This thing is A, B. You divide this thing into n points. You take a sample and you multiply by B minus A over N. What's B minus A over N? B minus A. It's the, the width of each subinterval, right? So what we're doing is taking the area of this rectangle, right? We take the height and then multiply by the width of the base, right? We take some sample point, height, width, and base, height, width, and base, blah, 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 okay? What happens is n goes to infinity, right? As, as, as n goes to infinity, what is this thing? This thing becomes the area, the area right? This thing becomes, so this thing, as n goes to infinity, this thing turns into the, in, the definite integral <coughs> divided by b minus a. Okay. Right. So this thing over here, if we took you know a billion samples and added them together and divided by a billion, a trillion samples added them together and divided by a trillion, what we're actually doing is getting towards this. In other words. This is really the average value of the function. This is literally the average value of your function over the interval. Okay. okay. Anyway, that was just, if you didn't get it, that's okay. Um, that's just for, just to let you look at it from another point of view. Okay. Okay. Um, any, any, any questions? Okay, that's it for today. That's it for today. If you didn't turn in your homework, um, please give it to me. Uh, last one, I just yeah.